Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to AP U.S. History, as we look today at the beginning of the Great Depression. The 1920s were a period of prosperity for America. Americans bought goods on the installment plan and speculated in stocks. Um, stocks bought on margin, paying a little bit down, um, and the rest when they could resell the stocks. Speculating in stock, of course, meaning buying stocks with the expectations they can be resold relatively soon when their value increases. And throughout the 1920s, it seemed that the value of stock was increasing um, indefinitely. America's factories were turning out more uh, goods at a rate previously unimagined um, and paying wages more than double those known in the past. And so in 1928, Herbert Hoover, um, who'd been Secretary of Commerce under Harding and Coolidge, ran for president with a promise of a chicken in every pot and a car in every garage. His opponent was Al Smith, um, the uh, former mayor of New York, known as the Happy Warrior. But Smith had problems, although very popular in his home state, um, or at least his hometown of New York City. There were several points against him. He was a Catholic at a time when many Americans especially Southern Baptists and German-American Lutherans, still deeply distrusted Catholics and feared that if he were elected, he would immediately begin taking orders directly from the Pope. He was also against prohibition, making him unpopular with many fundamentalists. Um, and this showed a split within the Democratic Party. Rural um, conservative Democrats tended to support temperance, were more urban Democrats, particularly those who were immigrants or the children of immigrants, opposed prohibition. Um, and a big split within the Democrats, um, one that hurt Smith badly. Smith was also against lynching, um, making him unpopular with many Southern Democrats. And so Hoover defeated Smith in a landslide. Um, indeed, Smith actually won um, almost all his votes in the part of the country that liked him least, that being the South. Um, but few Southerners were willing to vote for the party of Lincoln. The Civil War's only been over for 63 years, after all. Although, Hoover even picked up some votes in the South. And Americans expected the prosperity of the Jazz Age to continue forever. But there were already problems. Farmers, of course, had been poor throughout most of the 1920s due to falling food prices. Um, furthermore, people had already bought pretty much everything they could or would buy on the installment plan. 60% of cars, 80% of radios had been bought on the installment plan. Many other things have. And the fact is, you only need so many cars, you only need so many radios, so many other manufactured goods, and people had bought pretty much everything they wanted or everything they could afford. The installment plan may involve a small monthly payment, but those small monthly payments add up if you have enough. And so people began buying less. Factories continued to produce, or perhaps overproduce, um, and had to find something to do with that production, um, or else build up huge surpluses. Of course, today, if a country produces a lot, they typically hope to sell it overseas. But that was difficult in the 1920s. Throughout the 1920s, conservative Republican presidents had raised the tariff several times, which for most of the 20s had protected American workers, contributing probably to the prosperity of the decade. But as American tariffs had gone up, foreign tariffs had gone up too. As long as Americans were buying American-made goods, that didn't matter much. But now that we wanted to sell our products overseas, those high tariffs got in the way, um, gumming up foreign trade at a time we really needed some. And so as factories could no longer sell goods, the value of their stocks fell. As stocks fell, people began selling their stocks, hoping to uh, unload them before they lost too much value. But with many sellers and few buyers, stock prices fell further than ever. Um, some losing half their peak for a decade or more. Some going completely bankrupt. This began October 23rd, 1929. And in the past couple financial crises, 
J.P. Morgan had stepped in. By now, J.P. Morgan himself is dead, but his money lives on. And they were able, once again, to hold off a depression for six days. October 29th, though, was Black Tuesday, when the stock market crashed completely, wiping out fortunes, leaving many speculators with huge debts to pay off and no way to do so. And this is often viewed as the beginning of the Great Depression. Although, that can be a bit misleading, because at first the stock market crash mostly just hurt people who had invested in the stock market. And it's true, more Americans were invested in stocks than ever before, but that was still only about 4% of the population. But many banks had invested in stocks too. And all the banks were tied into a nationwide financial system. Loans banks had made to stock speculators couldn't be paid back. Investments that banks had made in stocks were often worthless. And um, people who um, were worried about the crash began withdrawing their money from their banks. And so, over the next couple of years, small banks began to suffer. And as people panicked and began to withdraw money from their banks, this led to runs on the bank. As people went to their bank and tried to withdraw their money, while it was still there. Um, and of course, um, banks only have so much money on hand. Most of the money you deposit in the bank, the bank then lends out to others at interest. It's how they make their money. But it means if everybody wants to withdraw their deposits at once, the bank will run out. Some banks locked their doors, others didn't do it quick enough and went bankrupt. And people who hadn't got their money out in time lost it forever as more and more banks failed. Indeed, within two years, by 1931, over 4,000 banks had failed across the United States. Now, it's possible the Federal Reserve System might have done something about this. Indeed, the Federal Reserve's role is in part to act as a bank for our banks. And perhaps they could have lent money to struggling banks to keep them afloat. The Federal Reserve might have printed more money and put it into circulation, um, but it wasn't willing to do so, um, fearing that that would just destabilize the economy more. And there were a number of legal limits on what the Federal Reserve could do in terms of pumping money into the economy. So it wasn't able to act um, as quickly or on as large a scale as it might have in later generations. So again, bank failures spread across the country. Um, businesses began to close. Unemployment shot up. Ford Motor Company, despite an attempt to keep people on staff by cutting hours, eventually laid off 75,000 workers just at Ford alone. By 1933, the worst year of the Great Depression, unemployment reached 25%. That's principally considering adult men, uh, many women not being considered part of the labor force, they were not really considered in the unemployment rate. Um, and in addition to those totally unemployed, many people were underemployed, having some kind of job, but not really making as much money as they wanted or needed. But at a time um, when there was very little in the way of government welfare, um, making any money was better than making nothing. And so Americans had to cut back. At mealtimes, uh, milk was replaced by water. Meat almost completely vanished um, from many tables. Even people who had money learned to save it carefully because they might lose their jobs any moment. Um, many of those who had jobs were working fewer hours for lower wages, bringing home pay reduced by a third or more. It seemed to many people that the American dream was over. And for many who lived through this, they were scarred for life, um, saving large amounts of money, often even hiding it around the house, rather than entrusting it to a bank that might fail. Many homeowners um, and farmers had their homes foreclosed upon, um, or those who rented often couldn't pay their rent and ended up homeless. Um, some built... Uh, built cardboard or plywood shacks, sometimes grouped together in shanty towns 
which they came to call Hoovervilles. Hoover's name being used uh, for a slang term for many of the hardships faced during the Depression. Other people, especially men, took to the rails, looking for work um, as transient workers uh, or as hobos, and often jumping on passing train cars and hoping the railroad police didn't find them and throw them off, especially if the train was moving and they did it. Um, while traveling the road to the rails, they might stop in their own camps, known as hobo jungles, um, so-called because they could be pretty wild and dangerous places with all these unemployed traveling men. In cities, um, people who could might stand in line for, uh, in red lines to get free food from either private or government-run charities. Others might go to soup kitchens um, and get a free or cheap meal, and possibly provided by the local government, possibly by private charities like the Salvation Army. And crop prices continued to fall, um, particularly a problem in the South, um, although in other parts of the country too, um, where many sharecroppers and tenant farmers um, ended up being forced off their land because as crop prices fell further and further, even, the, uh, the, you know, even what they could produce and share with the landowner simply wasn't worth the trouble. Um, and some moved west looking for work. Things were bad too, probably even worse, in the Great Plains. Of course, all the, um, the technology, particularly new types of plows that in the 1800s had allowed farmers to farm the plains, had destroyed the topsoil. There were no longer those grass roots, that sod to hold the land together. And a series of droughts in the uh, late 1920s and lasting through the 1930s let all that soil dry up with no grass roots to hold it in place, much of it was blown away in windstorms, creating a region known as the Dust Bowl. Um, as dust might be blown from one farm to cover a farm next door, like a blizzard of dirt. Some was blown so far away um, that they found red soil from North Dakota uh, in New England, where it stained the snow red. Um, again, much of the Great Plains came to be known as the Dust Bowl. Um, for impoverishing the farmers found there, too. Such that as many as 60% of farmers in this region may have lost their farms in the early and mid-1930s. And like southern sharecroppers and tenant farmers forced off their land, many of these farmers who lost their farms in the Dust Bowl headed west for California, um, a heavily agricultural region um, that always needed more farm workers to pick oranges and peaches and, and other crops. And although people went to California from all over the country, so many came from Oklahoma um, and were known as Okies. But all these farm workers heading west um, are remembered as Okies today. All the time there are Arkies from Arkansas and people from all over the south and the Great Plains. Um, their story is best remembered today because of some of the works of John Steinbeck, particularly his novel The Grapes of Wrath, and the movie based on it. Um, also his short novel of Mice and Men. Um, the Grapes of Wrath telling the story of um, poor farmers forced west uh, to look for work in California and having a pretty hard time of it. And of Mice and Men looking at um, traveling workers in California too. Um, again, not having an easy go. Um, although, um, as bad as things were for farmers, they had been bad for farmers for so long that some at least claimed that when the Depression hit, they didn't even notice. They'd already been poor for a decade. As bad as it could be, at least those who managed to hold on to their farm somehow could produce their own food. So at a time when people were starving in cities, um, eating stretch eating uh, rats and stray cats, which were nicknamed roof rabbit, because uh, the idea of eating cat by itself was a bit much. At least people in the countryside didn't starve. Locally, um, one of uh, our famous local attractions, Barter Theater, the State Theater of Virginia, began during the Depression, 
when a group of actors in New York City were starving, as actors often do, but especially during the Depression. But one of them from Abingdon, Virginia, said back home, nobody's starving, but nobody gets to see a play either. So they packed up, moved to Southwest Virginia, um, and began bartering um, tickets for their plays for locally produced food. Um, and, uh, and they're still going strong today. All today they prefer cash or a credit card. And the Depression did not just affect people's income. It affected how people felt about themselves, about their place in society. Men who'd been their family's breadwinners and now weren't often felt worthless. Women sometimes had to become breadwinners, going to work at odd jobs or doing sewing at home. Children could tell their parents were depressed, even if they didn't always understand why. In some cases, this brought um, families closer together. In other cases, they broke up under the stress. Um, another thing contributing to the population of traveling hobos um, is men, men might travel hoping to find money to support their families. Others might travel away ashamed they couldn't support them at all. And things were even worse um, for minorities. The Great Migration, of course, had seen many African Americans move north, looking for better jobs in the factories of northern cities. But when hard times hit, if you had to fire somebody, you probably fired the black guy first. So at a time when unemployment on average was about 25%, among black workers in 1932, the unemployment rate was around 50%. In the Southwest, Mexican Americans um, faced discrimination as, um, as some Anglo Americans demanded they be sent back to Mexico by force if necessary, ignoring the fact that some had ancestors who had lived there since the 1500s, long before any other Americans had arrived. Um, hundreds of thousands, though, did voluntarily return to Mexico on their own, life in the U.S. no longer looking that great. Many, of course, did remain, though, in the Southwest. And, and in desperation, some people turned to crime. Of course, bootlegging um, continued in the late 1920s and early 1930s. Um, bank robberies and other types of robberies gained national attention. Um, and 1932, the crime of the century was perpetrated. Um, when the young son of the most famous man in America, Charles Lindbergh Jr., um, was kidnapped, a ransom note was delivered to his parents. A search was held for the Lindbergh baby. Um, but eventually, Charles Lindbergh Jr. was found dead. The man accused of kidnapping and murdering him, known as the most hated man in America, a German immigrant named Bruno Hauptmann, was eventually caught and executed, um, facing the electric chair in 1936. Um, one response to this was the Lindbergh Law, which made kidnapping, if it crossed state lines, a federal crime. Kidnapping was always illegal, of course, but up till this point, it was a state matter. But this kidnapping attracted so much attention, and it became a federal crime, at least if you cross state lines. Now, Herbert Hoover insisted that prosperity was just around the corner. He tried to bring America out of the Great Depression. Indeed, it was he who first used the term depression, or at least popularized it, um, feeling that made things sound not so bad. In the 1800s, a financial crisis had been called a crash or a panic, but he felt the panic of 1929 would sound too scary. This wasn't a crash, it wasn't a panic, it was just a little depression that we would work through. Except this depression turned out to be so great, we have never dared use that term again. And, as the economy suffered, um, the Republican Party, in charge of the presidency and much of Congress, responded the way Republicans had traditionally tried to help the economy, which was with an even higher tariff. So in 1930, the Hawley-Smoot tariff was passed, which may be the highest tariff in American history, comparable to the McKinley tariff or the tariff of abomination. Um, this made foreign goods completely unable to compete in American markets, but then foreign countries simply raised their tariffs, already pretty high, even higher. Um, 
international trade was already pretty limited due to the pretty high tariffs of the 1920s, the Holly Smoot tariff simply shut down foreign trade um, completely. And this meant that the depression in the United States spread to or contributed to depressions in many countries in Europe. Britain, closely tied to the United States, suffered a depression not as bad as America's, but pretty bad. The country hit worst of all was Germany, who had had a pretty hard time ever since the Treaty of Versailles, um, which had placed crushing reparations on Germany forcing Germany to pay off billions of dollars in, in damages for World War I in gold. Now, the United States had tried to help with this. The Dawes Plan of 1924, the Young Plan of 1930, um, had helped Germany pay their reparations. But as the Depression got worse in the United States, we could no longer afford to refinance Germany's reparations. Um, likewise, American companies who had invested in Germany in the 1920s could no longer do so. And the depression that hit Germany would be even worse than the depression in the United States. And some Germans would grow desperate and look for leaders who could solve their problems. Now, Hoover wanted to solve America's problems, but he believed, as most uh, politicians to this point, aside from the progressives, had felt that the government should not do too much for individuals. Even the progressives had preferred widespread um, or large-scale reform, not individual relief. And Hoover felt the same. Um, he, at least it was not the federal government's job to provide direct aid. He did encourage volunteerism asking businesses to voluntarily keep employing the same number of people. Indeed, in financial crises, businesses prefer to keep their staff on hand if they can, so when things get better, they won't have to find and train new workers. Some companies tried to do this, particularly Ford, but after a while, they couldn't keep it up. Um, he asked private charities um, to support people, and um, volunteer work and charitable giving rose to, uh, to new heights. And from Hoover's point of view, this had worked during and after World War I when he'd organized massive food relief efforts to help starving Europeans during World War I and even into the early 1920s. But although charitable giving rose enormously during the Great Depression, it wasn't enough um, to fully deal with such a massive crisis. Hoover did feel the government could do some things, um, and the government cut taxes, which the government had been doing across the decade, but now did so further. The U.S. government lowered interest rates, hoping that would make it easier for people to pay off their loans and even attract them to take out new loans, because the borrowing rate would be so low. Um, he did eventually create some public works programs, um, building uh, some roads and bridges and other public works to try to create jobs and prop up the economy. And late in his presidency, um, he convinced Congress to create the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which allowed the government to lend money to large companies um, so they could stay afloat and keep their workers employed. Or at least that was the idea. Um, in fact, it didn't turn out to do a whole lot um, to keep people employed, but it put a couple billion dollars into the hands of private corporations. Um, by the standards of the day, a pretty radical and big spending act. Um, but many people felt it was just benefiting the big corporations. Um, most of these programs had not seemed real successful at the time, although some of the public works built under Hoover, or begun under Hoover, we still enjoy today. Boulder Dam, for example, later renamed Hoover Dam in the president's honor, um, began during Hoover's presidency and was for a long time the largest dam 
Um, but such successes were fairly rare, or certainly seem to be fairly rare. And even if Hoover was much more active than most previous presidents probably would have been, it seemed to many people to be far too little, especially when they compared it to the policies of later presidents. Another thing, too, was Hoover, besides his faith in volunteerism, had faith in localism. He believed local governments could best solve local problems. He was not opposed to local governments offering some direct relief to people in trouble. He just didn't think the federal government should do it. He said if every area could solve their own problems, it would add up and all the country's problems would be solved. Um, indeed, many areas had, and had for a long time, had some forms of, uh, of public relief or charity. But today, in 1929, 1930, 31, 32, the country is so interconnected by railroads, by roads, by the telegraph and telephone and radio, that in a way, every place is now local to everywhere else. If one place did offer more generous relief, people might come in from elsewhere and overwhelm the relief efforts of that place. Um, in such a big um, national, indeed international crisis, local governments just weren't up to the task. And, and Herbert Hoover, in some ways, just did not understand the public mood. Um, although in private, he was quite compassionate um, he did not really come off that way. Furthermore, um, he was wealthy, um, a self-made millionaire, um, and a depression did not really directly affect him. And he came off to many people as indifferent, maybe even unaware of their problems. And so some people wanted truly radical responses. The, um, the Communist Party in America grew and some communists wanted a socialist revolution that would make the government take care of the people, perhaps even an outright communist revolution, placing the means of production in the hands of the workers. On the other hand, inspired by the fascists in Italy um, and later Germany, there was a fascist movement in the United States wanting a strong national government that would force people to work together. Most Americans, though, as hard as things were, still had faith in democracy, um, still believed um, that progress was possible, that the American dream could come true. So there was no socialist revolution. There was no fascist revolution. The most radical movement um, during the Depression however, was the creation of what was known as the Bonus Army. Back in 1924, when times were good, Congress had promised to pay all World War I veterans a lump sum pension in 1945. But as the Depression got worse, many veterans said, we can't wait till 1945, we would like that pension now. And so in 1932, 20,000 unemployed veterans marched on Washington, D.C., demanding an early payment of their pension, of their bonus. When they reached Washington, D.C., they set up a huge camp, a Hooverville, essentially, outside town. Um, the police came and told them to leave. Um, now, Hoover personally sympathized with the bonus army, at least to a point. But he felt they were threatening the government, and that was unacceptable. And so he sent Douglas MacArthur to run them off. But General MacArthur used excessive force. The cavalry pulled their sabers um, and charged through the camp. Um, tear gas was fired into the camp. Fires broke out. Um, U.S. soldiers um, marched to the streets with their bayonets fixed to drive away ragged veterans and their families. And all this showed up in the newspapers and the magazines and the newsreels that played in the theater before the movie. Americans saw pictures um, and heard reports of hundreds of veterans being wounded or killed, and Hoover's popularity, already very low, fell even further. 
And although he ran for re-election in 1932, he had, I'm sure, and I'm sure he knew, he had no real chance 